and thank you for joining us for a discussion today about overcoming the challenges of remote hiring. This is a lead dev webinar created in partnership with Carrot. And this will last roughly about 45 minutes. Um, after that, myself and other panelists will be joining over to the Slack channel and answering some questions on the hiring channel. Um, we may also have some time to answer questions from the Q&A, so definitely, um, you know, like ask away. Um, and so I'd like to kick us off with some introductions. Uh, first off, I'm Ellen, uh, Ellen Wong, Director of Engineering at Calm. And I am going to let my panelists, um, today I'm uh, joining with me uh, to talk about hiring is Allison Tramali, Lena and Shannon. I'm calling you out from the gallery view here. So welcome. And I would like you all to introduce yourself. Why don't we start up with you, Allison? Great. Um, I am Allison McMillan. I'm a director of engineering at GitHub. Um, I run the coding department, which is primarily code spaces, repositories, and pull requests. Um, and I have been hiring uh, remotely for over a decade now, uh, multiple companies, also multiple industries. Uh, so both in tech and then before I switched careers, I was in the in the nonprofit world, so also um, hiring remotely in in nonprofit for a variety of of positions and uh, different levels of experience. I'll go ahead and go next. Uh, Tramiel Turner. I am the head of traffic at Stripe. Traffic is responsible for the software defined network topology that enables Stripe engineers to deliver fast, resilient, reliable, and hopefully error free connectivity to our partners and our users. I have been hiring for a lot of years. I'm not gonna say how many exactly because I want you all to believe that I'm very young. And we are presently a remote friendly, if not necessarily a remote first organization within traffic. That is to say that we do have sort of a, a central hub where most of our engineers are, but we also have very about 25% of our engineers remote. And then Stripe as a whole has about 30% of its engineers remote. And we in fact have a so-called remote hub where that remote team has uh, a formal leadership pillar and support. And uh, super happy to be here. Lena, do you want to go next or shall I? I'll go next. Perfect. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so Lena Reinhardt, I'm VP Product Engineering at Circle CI. We help teams ship value to their customers quickly and confidently. Um, and many of you may know our product. Um, the company I met now is over 500 people. My team is over 100. And my teams run everything between our application core data and growth engineering. Um, our organization has been distributed basically from the start. Um, we're a globally distributed team. And at the same time, we well, used to have offices. That's the only way to talk about them at this point. Um, but maybe they'll come back one day. I think we'll talk about that later. And um, I've been personally hiring also for many years, similar to Tremail. I'm not going to talk about how many, but remotely specifically for the last seven years, including for NGOs, startups, and many fast growing teams like the one that I lead now. Yeah, really happy to be here and learn from everyone. Shannon. Thank you very much. So my name is Shannon Hogan. I'm the Global Head of Solutions Engineering at Carrot, and I have a pretty amazing job. So essentially what we do is we help companies uh, hire and we conduct fair, predictive, and enjoyable interviews for those companies. We've done almost 100,000 interviews now worldwide, and all of those interviews were conducted remotely, hence why we're having this conversation. I've also been hiring engineers for a lot longer than I would like to say. I would also like to have the veil of youth. <laughs> on today with the rest of my panel, but it's very nice to be here. Well, I'm so excited to be uh, surrounded by my, our very youthful panel who has years of remote hiring experience. So, well, let's, let's kick us off with this first question. What are some unique challenges when it comes to remote hiring? Um, and, and if at all, are you doing anything differently in the past year uh, versus before? Um, um, Shannon, would you like to kick us off? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we a hundred percent of our interviews are are remote, and I'm not. I, there are a few unique challenges. Essentially, ensuring that you know it's a, a kind of an equitable conversation where you're helping folks be calm. You're listening a little bit more intently. You're not in person in order to read their body language. So it's extremely important to ensure that you know candidates are put in a space where they're safe to answer questions and they're comfortable, so that they can showcase their best selves. As far as remote hiring or even in-person hiring, you know, Carrot's position on this is, and mine in particular, is the most important thing is to have a rubric. And so understanding exactly what competencies that you're hiring for, ensuring that your, your rubric is built out, that each of the folks that are involved in that interview loop understand exactly which questions that they're asking, and also that you have a rubric for the responses uh, that people are providing. I think one of the unique uh, benefits, uh, frankly, of being remote is that as interviewers interview more, and they've been trained and I know a lot of you folks are working on that, um, they actually get better over time. And you have the opportunity now to record those interviews as we do at Carrot and be able to do, you know, kind of a feedback to your interviewers in, in order to ensure that your candidates have the opportunity to showcase their best selves and that they're interviewing properly. And so I think that's a benefit of, of being remote. And I think the challenges are similar, remote uh, and in person, except for, of course, that kind of feeding off human beings energy that you usually have in order to, to be able to help them get through the, the very nervous, uh, you know, place, which is that interviews change lives and you're helping someone change their life. Yeah, and I think that is absolutely so important to have a rubric because especially remote, you don't want to go off by just vibe and how you feel, right? Because so, so much information may not be able to, you know, transfer over a Zoom meeting and having rubric really gets you to have the interviewer talk about what worked or didn't work about this candidate, not just because of, you know, certain information that they may or may not get. So that definitely big plus one. Uh, Lena, I know you're also passionate about this topic. Uh, can you tell us more about, you know, your experience of you know, hiring? Sure, yeah, I, I would say my organization stopped hiring in person over three years ago. Um, so last year didn't signify a change for us. But what I would say is that the ongoing struggle we have is definitely scheduling and logistics around interviews. I know many co-located teams like to run interviews like in one day. It's, it's really neat because it allows you to ideally make a decision by the end of the day and the candidate gets, to, like, gets a very quick experience basically. Honestly, with a globally distributed team, we're rarely able to do that just because of the nature of time zones and everything that comes with them. So that's been a constant, I would say, uphill battle and figuring that out. Um, and also at the same time, still making sure we move candidates through the process fast and provide a really good candidate experience. And that candidate experience itself is something that I really am invested in and that we're, we've been constantly working on because making sure that someone feels connected, they have a sense of what the team is working on, what the role is going to be, how they're going to fit in, if they're going to be connected with people who are like them. I think from an equitability perspective, that's also really important. And from a sense of belonging specifically to your company. Um, and it's, I think what Shannon mentioned about rubrics, I wanted to connect on as well. I think it's really hard to get signal um, and especially for folks who may be really struggling with interview nervousness or who may have difficulties expressing themselves verbally because English may not be their first language and that's the language that your company is operating in. Like those kinds of things can be a little bit trickier to suss out during an interview. And so having interviewers who are really empathetic and have a sense of creating a, a safe environment as much as that's possible within the constraints of an interview um, can be really helpful. Um, but with that comes also that running interviews remotely can be much more just draining for interviews because they have to be, have a higher attention level than they might have in person where you're able to also pick up on just the signals of a person just being present in the room and feeding off each other's energy. And um, so that interviewer experience, preserving that and at the same time, you're building a good candidate experience and learning from them because the interviews happen in much more of isolation. Um, I think getting good, good feedback from candidates and using that to gather themes across interviews and then building on it and improving the interviewer experience and process that you're really putting forth. Yeah, are just a few things that come to mind. I don't know if you have others, others have things to add. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. I love what you said about, you know, providing a safe space um, for, for interviewee to, you know, basically perform the best selves. I think as engineering leaders, we talk a lot about doing that in our organization so that our employees can perform at their best and just be themselves. And it's like so much harder to do when you just met a candidate and also make them feel safe. So I love that, you know, there's an, you know, make an effort around that. Um, Allison, I know you're passionate about candidate experience as well. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, um, for us, you know, I think that every uh, every part of the interview process is as much for um, for us to interview candidate as it is for a candidate to interview us. Uh, you know, and so I think that as we go through rounds, um, you know, through our, our like our technical interview, for example, uh, we take candidates take home and we they have a discussion with engineers that they will be working with every day about that. So, you know, how did they approach the problem that they're solving? What, um, you know, what their thought process was like, these are these are the conversations that uh, if they join the team, they would be having every day with these same folks. And so, um, and same thing, we have a um, we have an additional interview on our, our leadership principles. So GitHub has values around growth mindset and practicing kindness. And, um, you know, so we have an interview around that, but really uh, it it's, the goal is to have it be as much like what a, what a day would look like as possible. Because I think that Again, as much as we are asking, you know, candidates questions, uh, you know, are these values also important to them? Um, you know, having a having a conversation about their, you know, technical experience um, and expertise. It is also important that like the candidate is really excited about the conversation that they're having about the work that they did um, with the folks that they will be working with. That they're also uh, making sure that that we're in line with what they want for their next role. Um, and so I, I think that that's also really, really important. And we make sure, um, you know, I mean, tech interview, the interview process, the interview process does generally have, you know, a few, a few rounds and is a little bit of a process, but we want to make sure that every step of that is uh, really meaningful and really helpful for not just for us as interviewers, but also for candidates who are interviewing. Yeah, I, I, I really like that where um, part of hiring, you know, hiring the person that can do the job, but it's also to evaluate, is this person going to be successful in your organization? And so by really embedding them into an environment where it's very much like what it would be uh, after they join, you can really, you know, hire the right fit that will last, right? I think that that is so important and, and, and really pays. Like we all know turnover is very expensive and draining. So yeah, absolutely. Like, Love that. Um, uh, Tramali, do you, you have anything like that you'd like to add to like around like candidate experience or have you ever gotten like really hard questions from candidate as you, you know, hire them and, and talk to them in the process? Yeah, I think one thing that, uh, first of all, super plus one to everything that's been said so far, but I think Shannon touched on it a bit and I'm going to pull on the thread a bit more. Measure your process get feedback, get signal on how well you're doing, because it's easy to make an assumption that you're doing all of the right things and that your candidate experience is good, but hear from the candidates and challenge yourself to make sure that the things that you assume to be true are in fact true and feel comfortable with discomfort because it's not normal for many folks to have as many conversations in this so-called virtual environment as we have all been living in in the last you know, 14 months now, I think. And so one of the things that we try to do is to get sentiment from candidates to understand, okay, we, we are pretty sure that our framework is comfortable and we are pretty sure that the rubric makes sense and that the kind of questions that we're asking makes sense. But getting that direct feedback and having that tight iterative loop of understanding whether or not what you believe true to be true is actually true, I think is critically important. As far as hard questions, candidates ask the best questions, uh, especially in this environment. One of the, I think, uh, classic questions that probably Elena has experienced uh, throughout the entirety of her career uh, managing remotely is, am I going to matter as a remote employee? And is my work going to be visible? And I think that's a great question. It is truly at the end of the day about impact. I mean, all candidates, all people, ourselves included, seek that mastery, autonomy, and purpose motion. And you want to be able to give candidates assurance that no matter where they are, if they're invited to join the company, they do matter. They're invited for a reason. They've reached that ephemeral bar 
and the expectation is that they will provide impact and hopefully outsized impact. And so being able to articulate in what ways you see their work mattering, how you will support amplifying, what tools you have in place to make sure that what you say is going to be true is actually true. And codifying that in a manner that, again, you measure and make sure that you're holding yourself accountable is critically important. I would want to connect with that because I completely agree and I'd want to expand it a bit into um, candidates, their only sense of basically ability to get a sense of your team, your company, your culture, your values and how you live those things and not just how you talk about them. Like it's from the interviews. It's currently for many people the only and for yet distributed teams forever the only way for candidates to actually get a sense of that without actually having signed a contract and started working with you. And so I think that's really important, which also because it also means over the course of a couple interview stages, they're going to learn everything and have to make a decision on that. And of course, candidates don't just use the interviews, they do their research, they look at LinkedIn, other professional networks, they read blogs, they look at things that people post on social media. And candidates are really informed. And so I think being cognizant of that, and maybe also taking a step back at some point and looking at, well, what's the impression that people are getting? What are the things that we're putting forth, the things that people are saying about working here, about the company, not just existing employees, but also people who are just part of the industry. I think that's a really important part because in the end that even goes into the candidate experience, even though it's not all just tied directly to the interview process. And then another part of that is also the questions that you ask and the way that the interviewers present themselves, the way they talk about their jobs, the things that they like or dislike about working there. Like all of those things will ultimately contribute to the picture of the team that the candidates are getting. And I think, yeah, being cognizant of that, being transparent with people, I think is really helpful there. Um, as, as Tramel said, I think candidates ask really quite great questions, often really pointed questions, um, and ultimately are trying to gauge whether they'll they'll belong and this whether this will be a place for them now, even more so than in yeah, co-located environments. Yeah, and I um I'll add to that also one question that we've gotten a lot from candidates is just how the how the company has handled things and life and work um, related to uh, related to COVID, which, you know, I think that for a lot of candidates, how this situation was handled is really a is really a signal of what the what the company is like, um, you know, I mean, I have two kids under the age of six, we've been doing the virtual kindergarten adventure this year. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's been a whole, it's been a very different year for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, even, even if the upcoming year isn't like the past year, uh, that's a question that we get a lot from candidates because it is a, it's a signal for, you know, if life things happen or if world things happen, um, how, how the company might respond and what that might look like for an individual coming into the company. Yeah, I, it says a lot of like very empathetic like leadership in this group and I absolutely love that. Um, I want to try deep diving into some of the answers here and, and see if the, the group here can share examples. Uh, when we talk about, you know, what will we pull the hard strings there in a bit was candidate asking, do I matter? Am I gonna to matter to your organization? Am I going to make an impact? Were there success stories or maybe not success stories that, that we can share here where, you know, we walk through candidate, maybe it, it actually didn't work out or what? what actually, you know, was challenging and, and became successful. Uh, if there's any stories this crowd could, you know, share here. I can break the ice here. So I, I think for, so we're moving a bit beyond the candidate experience and, and to perhaps the working experience as working as a remote employee with that question. And one of the things I think it's, it's really important for an organization not to have Sort of a class system and what i mean by that is if so right now everyone's remote and and for the most part and people are i think truly empathetic to the the sort of uh complexities that being remote brings uh when we're talking about uh you know i work in networks all day and it turns out that networks aren't always reliable they literally partition every minute of every day and when you have sort of that weird you know not quite 
synchronous conversation and not quite high, we talk about high bandwidth conversations and we use that colloquially to talk about the richness of the conversation, but quite literally, we're all engineers here, the, the bandwidth restrictions that you may be facing when you're talking to someone who's in Indonesia, who may be working for your company and you're, you're saying something and there's some weird sort of jittery thing happening on the other side. And, and it's kind of hard to, you know, have a salient conversation. That's a real thing. And it can be something that if you're not paying attention to might be endemic to a larger experience that, you know, the, the P99 experience of employee engagement in your company is bad and you're not getting signal on that. And though that sounds like a tried example, it's a really real example. And going further than that, I think if you, again, getting back to this notion of a class system, if you have an organization that is really centered on uh, physical space and where most people reside, but then you have this segment of employees who may be now joining your company remotely. So let's just say, for example, uh, this is actually a real example. It's not Stripe, but I'm not going to name the company. This, <laughs> your company is headquartered in New York and you start hiring remote because you have to in this moment. And your company has decided that it wants to embrace this notion of being as I mentioned at the beginning with my introduction, remote friendly. So maybe you're not remote first, but you're accepting this notion that, okay, there's talent out there that we can now start to accommodate and bring in. And maybe that helps push the, uh, the opportunity for our company to provide that impact further faster because we're able to bring in this great talent. But again, if you're centered on that location, all of your employees for the most part to date have been in New York, but now you're hiring people in Colorado and you're not cognizant of time zones or you're not cognizant of time management. I've seen this as a real example, even at Stripe so many times during the pandemic where people will start talking and I'm doing it right now. How long have I been talking? No one likely knows, but I've been looking. I've been talking for about two and a half minutes and it may seem like a really long time or it may seem like a really short time depending on how acclimated you are to this environment. And if your company has no idea how to manage those type of meta signals and how to deal with making sure that you're concise, making sure that you have plan, making sure that you have, if you're going to have a meeting, that that meeting matters and it's a really rich meeting and it's not something where, you know, people walk away from it going, man, that could have been an email. Why did we spend an hour on a video chat for something that wasn't really high value for me? And you're not testing again getting back to this notion of measuring whether or not the framework that you have in place and the tools that you have supporting that framework is truly something that's a benefit to your organization, you're hitting a failure mode. So I, it's very interesting. It kind of touch on a point that, because a lot about remote hiring, like hiring in a way, it's not done un, until like in a way the person's on board, it, right? Hiring doesn't automatically make a business more valuable or an organization more productive. It's actually successful onboarding that adds value for the company. And so that's actually a super important point. And in a distributed workforce, you touch on a point that's, you know, very, very real is like, we have a new definition of inclusion now. Um, like one example I could think of is like when at a previous job, I, I actually had to work with people in different locale and different time zones, sometimes completely opposite time zone. Uh, and we were in San Francisco and there was a team in Tel Aviv completely opposite time zone. And we want to be inclusive and want to invite folks in Tel Aviv on tech spec review, reviewing technical decisions, very important. But we just couldn't find a time that everybody would attend. And that was such a struggle. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious to, you know, the folks, the rest of the folks here in the room who hasn't talked for more than two and a half minutes that, you know, do you have ideas or, or stories around these kind of challenges? Right. Like, how do we convince our candidates that this isn't going to be their new reality? And, and what do we do with it? So I, I would start with like with any inclusion topic, really, you, you create the environment before you bring the people in. And I know that's really hard and can also be difficult to make a business case for. Um, I'm cognizant of that. But I do think ultimately, I mean, business case can be made, first of all. And ultimately, it's the only way to make that successful. Um, the big, the big um, trap that I would really advise to avoid is basically trying to replicate what you've done in person in a distributed team, just because 
a lot of especially leadership work often relies on like in-person signal reading the room um, and a lot of kind of responding to the presence of people in the environment and it's just fundamentally different you need to be much more cognizant as a leader in the approaches you use the frameworks you build the structures you provide um, in a distributed team and so I would go in with basically what is what are you looking to achieve like what's what are you trying what's what's success for this process so Ellen you mentioned for example that the hiring is successful when people have onboarded when they've started delivering when they together with their team accomplish the first goals and then working backwards from there and making sure to actually identify the structures you need in place for that to happen. So instead of, for example, trying to get everyone on meetings, figuring out what's the information that we need to share, what are the places where we can do that? Um, instead of using status updates, helping building avenues where people can provide those asynchronously, um, putting together using written information, really write everything out is probably the biggest one. Have a landing place for people where they can find information about the company, the strategy, the goals, how what their team is doing, how the processes work, all those kinds of things. Um, and I think ultimately treat, I, I think what Tremail said earlier about the hierarchy that needs to be avoided is really important. I, I think or my, my stance has always been because I've had hybrid teams many times, whenever there's one person remote, everyone is remote. Um, this means that there's no meetings with everyone in one room and then three people on the Zoom screen. Um, those kinds of things are like basically figuring out what an equitable experience looks like where everyone has the same opportunities to participate, to contribute, to have their voice heard, to be listened to. Um, and to be able to affect change in your team and looking at those really small interactions in meetings, how decisions are getting made um, to identify those points and basically build the experience around that. Yeah, I love that. If it's okay, if I speak a little bit more, I, I'm so I, you know, my brain always goes to inclusivity, obviously, like that's something that's, you know, we are, our mission is to unlock opportunity for folks and that's opportunity internally as an employee and also a, a opportunity in tech in general. And it, touching on what Lincoln was saying, I mean, inclusive meetings, if you have the opportunity to have somebody come and train you on inclusive meetings for a remote environment, do it. You know, we we recently had a woman come who's an expert in this topic, and it was extremely helpful where we actually have roles in each of our meetings now where we have, you know, an inclusive Yoda as an example. So every meeting has somebody who's going to call out the difficult questions or stop people from speaking over two and a half minutes. <laughs> Sorry, but you know these are the types of ways we also she uh, spoke about having cards that you raise or hand raising saying hey I'd, I'd like to speak because in a in a an environment you know we're all local and you have that kind of interpersonal connection you do sometimes have those advocates in the room that will say hey by the way I, I think you know Elena or Allison were speaking right or something like this but remote that can be very difficult to do and so having inclusive meetings and that structure and having that as like a company-wide policy is actually really helpful the other thing that I would say is I you know we're I'm all about candy experience I want people to to feel amazing but it does like Tremel was saying have to extend into your culture so and, and Lena. So if you don't have a culture of inclusivity and you don't have a culture where folks feel valued, when they interview people, it will be clear that they don't feel included or you know valued as a as a candidate. And so that that's important whether you're you know striving to have a more diverse workforce or even just striving to have a more remotely diverse workforce. You know, it's important in every situation that you build the culture that you want to hire. And so if you want to hire folks remotely, if you want to hire folks that are coming from places that may not have the greatest connection, start to make those adjustments, as the team was saying early on, so that when folks come on, you've already done the work and you have that culture of inclusivity and you don't have to kind of backtrack. And, and also that comes across in your interview process. If you have an interview process, what Tramiel was saying earlier, it, it, it was so relatable to me, is that if you're not measuring each part of the interview process and you know at some point you, you start to measure and you notice that your more diverse candidates or your remote candidates are dropping off at a specific person, you're not going to know that that specific person may not be aligned with your, your company values. And, that, and that's hugely important, especially if you're looking for cultural fit, you do have to think about your company's values and your leadership principles, because that's really difficult to do remotely. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, literally, my, my brain is like taking notes here, because 
like now, you know, vaccines are rolling out and, and Incalm had became a remote first company, but we do have a headquarters in San Francisco where a lot of employees actually live. So we, we will eventually go back to the office, at least some of us. And we also started hiring remotely. So we are going to have a hybrid workforce. And like, I, I really like the part that I think, Lena, you talked about, um, you know, you, you have to lay the groundwork basically to, to make it work for people um, instead of just like figuring out as we go. Uh, if someone, you know, if there's one person remote, everyone's remote, that's, ooh, that's that's hard to implement. I'm, I'm thinking about how, how I'm gonna do that in meetings. And, and I absolutely love Shannon, you talk about learning how to have inclusive meetings because I'm, I'm already seeing it now where people have, the greatest intentions, but may not actually do things that they want to be inclusive, but they don't actually end up doing things that are in fact inclusive. And I think, yeah, those are all things I'll, I'll take to mind. Um, I don't know, Allison, if you have anything to add, you've been remote forever, so teach us <laughs> all your tricks. Um, I mean, one thing that we're thinking about as, uh, as folks start to think about, you know, as vaccinations roll out, and, and it is different, right, like vaccinations are rolling out, um, but vaccinations for children aren't rolling out, right, so like my partner and I are thinking through like, okay, once the adults that we know are vaccinated, like what our new risk calculation is, because for us with children who will not be vaccinated probably for a little while, like there's, you know, there's still, there's still a, a risk calculation there, um, but I think that one thing to think about is also that uh, what remote looks like is different than what remote in the past year looks like is different than what remote friendly or remote first will look like for the upcoming year as more vaccinations roll out. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's for, for me, it's been a very different remote experience this past year, right? Usually remotely, I, I meet up with folks, I co-work sometimes, like I just have a my, my children are not in the house all the time, 24 seven with, you know, um, it's, it's just a very different experience. And so, uh, you know, I think that as folks and, and a lot of people's situations have changed, right? They, um, they've moved, their childcare arrangements have changed, like things, things are different than what they looked like a year ago. Uh, and so I think also, as we look at what it looks like for some folks to go back in person, either in a hybrid culture or, culture or um, you know, we at GitHub have, we have a couple of uh, headquarters and offices. Most folks work, uh, most folks work, work remotely, but it will still look different. So taking into consideration those, those differences and um, how, to, how to accommodate those moving forward as well. Awesome. Well, I was told there are some questions in the Q&A. Uh, uh, panelists want to answer some questions from the audience? Cool. Good. Um, all right, here's a question from Carlos. Uh, based on your experience, what actions have you implemented or think are important to measure in an interview process? Yeah. I'll just start, but I think others have things to Go for um, it. I would say as much as possible, um, but then at the same time, if you haven't measured anything, start small and increment your way towards it. Um, so a um, couple of things, we do hiring manager training and interviewer training, making sure that everyone's completed those, learning from you know, the experience that people are having going through it and continuously being able to improve it. So we have a mix of quantitative and qualitative feedback on that. Um, that's one aspect. And then obviously the interview process itself. Um, so we do candidate surveys, um, which um, reflect on questions like, um, are, did the interviewers show up on time? It's common courtesy, it's important to us. Um, how was the interview experience? Did people get a good sense of the company, of the role, the team? Do they understand what, what they'd be signing up for? So what the goals would be, what the expectations would look like, those kinds of things. Again, a mix of qualitative and quantitative data, um, but then also the basically the pipeline, like how are um, how are we doing? Like are we are we losing people at certain points of the process disproportionately? which would then prompt us to look at the interview stage. Um, so those are just a couple that come to mind. I'm sure others have things to add. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that one as well. Uh, and I think it gets into Miguel's question 
uh, asked directly to me as well. Uh, strong plus one to everything Lena said, but Shannon hit the point that I think is deeply resonant and one that we shouldn't ignore. It's really easy to over-index on measuring the process and making sure that the process is right, but measure the people too. It so happens that every once in a while, even though you all, everyone attending today probably works at an incredible company full of incredible people who are well calibrated, extremely experienced interviewers, that sometimes when you change the context, people may not be meeting the expectations and may need to be recalibrated, or you may need to make the difficult decision, difficult decisions matter when you're a leader, to remove people out of the interview loop. Why? Because sometimes, sometimes when people are in this new context, they do lose track of time. They may show up to conversations late. They may lose the whatever worked for them in person ability to sell. I mean, these are sell chats, right? We're trying to attract people to our organization because there are so many other organizations that they have the choice to go to. And you absolutely don't want someone in the interview loop who is doing something antithetical to that process and making the candidate experience seem somewhat bad, or let's just call it as it is, objectively bad. You don't want that, right? That is something that is not great for the candidates, not great for your organization. And we mentioned this earlier, candidates, it turns out, talk to one another and they leave notes on things like, all of those many sites that talk about our companies, uh, blind, whatever. And so let's make sure that we're measuring the people as well and making sure that folks have the tools that they need to practice and become comfortable in this environment where we are either hybrid, remote first, or remote preference. Do, do we have any suggestions for tools um, that I think one audience question is like any tools that we could leverage um, that you've used, any of you? I think most applicant tracking systems have many of those things built in. I think otherwise, just been using forms for a lot of internal <laughs> things, and then for measuring uh, onboarding success, which I think is another last one really important. Um, different different metrics, honestly, but we have no one tool that does it all. If others have it, please let me know. Yeah, we we also leverage our ATS, but the thing that I think. Uh, it, not or all organizations are going to have this depending on the size and scale of your organization but if you do have the scale to accommodate or if you have a strong partner uh, like I, I believe one of those partners is represented in, in our panel today uh, to augment your team having a strong uh, people organization and a recruiting organization within that people organization that can help uh, hold the organization accountable for the experience and for the people who are engaged in the experience, I found as an incredibly good lever to make sure that you're getting the right telemetry and the right signal and that you're, you know, leveraging the tooling that you have, be that, you know, Word or Google Docs or Sheets or Excel, anything that's rudimentary works as long as you're doing something to make sure you're getting that signal and getting that telemetry necessary to, again, hold yourself accountable. So another question from the audience here, actually for Allison, um, in the interest of exploring case studies, uh, like how has a technical test adapted to being fully remote? Um, yeah, there's a declining appetite for tech home test, um, which I can I can empathize. Um, yeah, if any. Yeah, so um, I will very transparently say that I have I have pretty strong feelings around lengthy uh, technical take-homes and what uh, what they measure and what they show. Um, our uh, our technical take-home um, for my department is, uh, it's, it's a 90 minute um, problem approach basically. So, uh, you know, so we, we provide candidates with sort of a problem prompt and we say like, how, like, how would you approach thinking about a solution for this problem? What, um, what might a solution look like? What might some of the trade-offs be? And we provide a template with sort of, you know, questions to, to answer and guide them through. Um, we keep it to 90 minutes because uh, really prefer not to have anything. And, and we do it also time-based because you know, I found in the past, a lot of times, if you have a technical take home where you say like, oh, this should take approximately four to six hours, but there's no time box, you'll have candidates that 
I mean, I, I like to say the, the last time that I had six hours straight of focus time to work on something was six and a half years ago before my first child was born, right? And so, um, you know, and you'll have folks that really can only take four hours broken up into a few different increments in order to work on it, whereas you'll also have candidates that may have the luxury of taking 16 hours to work on it, right? Um, and so, you know, we try to, uh, we, we keep our take home short. I, I will also add that if I could design my most ideal interview process in the world, I would actually give candidates a choice and say like, how do you feel like you would succeed best? Would you prefer to pair or would you prefer to do a take home? Because again, the goal of interviewing is not, it's not to trick candidates. It's not to like you, I as an interviewer want to see any candidate do their best work. And so whether that is pairing or a take home, um, in, people have very strong preferences as to as to what they prefer. So we have not gotten there yet. But if I were to be able to just design my design an ideal process in an ideal world, um, we would be able to have candidates choose uh, what what that technical portion looks like. I would love to jump in on this because we have a lot of data at care because, you know, it would be a whole lot cheaper for us to send people home with a take home test and we just have some software that would, you know, assess whether or not they did it well. And, and that's fine. That's okay. Except that what we've seen over and over again, the reason that people come to care and, and, and for the interview process is that take home tests in particular, anything that takes over an hour, an hour and a half, um, it, it doesn't provide an equitable experience. You have people that are changing their lives and their family lives, right, by going to a code academy working a couple jobs, going to school and trying to get a job in technology that will change their world. And, you know, if you want to be an equitable hiring partner, if you want to, to, diversity and inclusion on your team, of course, change the culture internally, but externally, if you send somebody home with a six hour take home and they're, you know, they have two jobs, they have a family, you know, people that they're taking care of, or even, you know, someone who just works longer hours, you are going to see a significantly larger drop off rate for women and people of underrepresented communities. Communities. And we've seen that time and time again. We've actually seen the rate go up to something like 60 to 70% for women and people of underrepresented communities. So be very careful with the, the type of take home quizzes. Also, by the way, a lot of people are now looking at these things. If you give them six hours of work that is applicable for your company, they're like, wait, why aren't you paying me? I'm doing I'm doing work for free just to get a job. It doesn't make sense. And so let's be respectful of the candidate experience and ensure that they don't feel as if you're trying to get free labor out of them and that you do understand that human beings have a life. I mean, we spoke about that earlier, pulling it back around. How do we feel valued? Well, you don't feel valued when someone says, hey, by the way, you need to take six hours and, and figure out a problem for me before you even get started. That's probably the worst way that you can kick off uh, in, a, in a more equitable and inclusive environment. Yeah, I, I personally have an experience like that, like a long time ago, interview at a startup where they gave me this more than six hour, honestly, take home. The take home involves spinning up a new microservice and, and a whole working functional endpoint and deployed into production. So, you know, imagine that amount of time. And it was, I remember like actually really liking the interview team and liking the founder, liking the product. But because of that particular thing, I'm like, I'm not sure I want to work here because this is, I don't see you having a successful hiring experience, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think like, you know, this is, this has been really great. There are more questions around like, oh, there's another question here. That's interesting. The last six months to a year with more companies going remote, uh, how have you all been able to differentiate yourself as a remote company to attract candidates? Um, and this anonymous person said, we have been seeing less applicants at the time has gone up. The, now everyone caught on this like magical like bullet uh, as a perk. So uh, love to hear from, from every one of you actually on this. I can jump really quickly. We, you know, we do a lot of studies about where you can hire. And I'm sorry, Lena, I keep jumping in. I hopefully, okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do a lot of studies on, you know, the availability now of folks like breaking into markets that are more diverse. So Pittsburgh's at Pittsburgh, as an example, has a huge, you know, group of tech folks there that people don't generally go to when they're doing recruiting, but it, it, it happens to be a city that's more diverse as Chicago is a more diverse city. And so for us, like, you know, being remote, I understand that we don't 
don't have applicants, but just make sure that you're not saying, hey, you're required to be in San Francisco, New York, or Seattle, because those are, yeah, they are well-performing tech, you know, areas, but they're less diverse than the Chicago's and the Pittsburgh that have just as capable candidates, especially we can see the data. So just as capable candidates as those other markets. And so I think being remote actually opens you up to the opportunity to have more diverse uh, engineers at your company. And so I would be open to different locations. Lena, we've, we've talked about candidate experience. Um, they, people talk, um, they, don't, they don't know. I also think being open, transparent and setting people up for success, honestly. Um, in many cases, it's more about finding candidates than candidates finding you, um, especially now that everyone's sort of remote. Um, yeah, Alison. Yeah, I, um, I'll add that it's also about what that remote experience looks like, right? So uh, it's one thing to say, you can work remotely with your laptop on your couch. And it's another thing to, um, you know, really provide the, uh, the, the benefits or the necessities that come with, um, with working remotely, right? So uh, equipment that folks are set up with, what that experience looks like, um, you know, are the, the benefits that are offered, are they really for the folks that are still in person at, you know, either the one headquarter or the multiple headquarters that exist, or uh, can they actually be applied to everyone and are they useful for everyone regardless of, um, regardless of where folks are working. So, you know, I think that that's also been a, an aspect, um, you know, candidate process, interview process, but then um, it, it looks very differently to work remote for different companies. And I guess I'll close this out really quickly. I think we've talked about a great deal about the process and about sort of centering on what your organization is doing in order to build more momentum around candidate interests and, and building a, a more rich pipeline. Don't forget to center on the candidate in any opportunity that you have. What you're going through in effect is a marketing motion and how are you marketing your organization? And do you have an engineering blog? Do you have uh, some mechanism by which you're going out into the environment and you don't need to do that physically? In fact, you can't do that physically in many instances today, uh, but you can have some form of outreach, uh, participate in things like Lead Dev Live. Do things that get the message out about what your organization is, what its mission is, and try to build a, a movement around that mission, that vision, and to all of the great points already made, making sure that the experience is one that you truly enable, invest in, report, and is something that you own. Center on the person, and I think you'll see better results. Well, all right. Thank you all. That was our last question. Um, any other question, we'll take it in Slack for panelists who can actually have more time. Um, I really love all of the, you know, input here, reminding ourselves that, you know, the interview process is, event, is essentially a cell chat. The whole thing is a marketing motion. And it's really about like, you know, what we put in and every company is different. So thank you so much for your insight. Is there any last thoughts from the panelists uh, here? Uh, I will do a shameless plug that we are hiring. Um, there's multiple positions open at GitHub. Uh, for my department in particular, um, we're hiring in US, Canada, and Europe, mid and senior levels. Um, you can look for the core products listing on the GitHub career site. I'll just keep the thread going. So CircleCI is hiring as well. Um, we're globally distributed, mostly hiring um, in North America and Europe as well for my teams. And we're hiring backend engineers, front end machine learning engineering managers. I'm also hiring an engineering director for my team. Um, yeah, we'd love to have you. And this has been great. Thanks everyone. I've learned so much. Stripe is always hiring. Uh, at the present, I believe we have 1,214 roles open. I don't know that number by heart. I looked it up, but I hire everywhere and my colleagues hire everywhere. Managers, managers of managers, managers of managers of managers, ICs, really talented people, creative people. Come work for us at Stripe and help build the economic future of this planet. 
I'm with you. I will do a shameless plug. If, if you want to, you know, it's really hard to be at startups. It's really hard uh, sometimes to have a connection, but if you're really connected to the mission of unlocking opportunity for people that may not have had those opportunities, people with underrepresented, from underrepresented communities, women, uh, non-traditional backgrounds, Carrot is hiring. We're actually growing pretty rapidly in the space because everybody is so dedicated as our other folks here too. So if you're interested in engineering, even working with some of our clients so go ahead and reach out and in conclusion every single one of our panelists here um, and including myself are hiring so thank you for your time and have a great rest of your day i'll see you on slack thank bye. you Ellen. thank you thank you bye all.